Okay, so the first speaker this morning is uh, Josef Malek from Prague, and he will speak on uh, thermodynamically consistent boundary conditions for corporate fluids. So thank you very much. I would like to say that I am really happy for this invitation, that I, uh, not only me, but also our PhD students from Prague could stay here during this, uh, this uh, trimester. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the next week when I'm again here. So uh, it's uh, for me quite unusual situation to be outside of my university and not to be at the conference. <laughs> so related probably to the age. But otherwise, in the 90s, I really spent here a lot of time. So I was uh, two and a half year postdoc uh, in the group of Jens Freire. And uh, I learned here in Germany, in Bonn, how the research should be organized and like. So this was a really, very good school for me. And of course, uh, the one aspect is scientific. Scientifically was excellent, but also another is about the, the organization of the research. And I think that this Hausdorff Institute of Mon for Mathematics basically goes in this direction. This is the workshop on the interfaces. And uh, I will basically touch it from two different angles. So one will be really focused on the quarterly fluids, but I will do it in the second part. And in the first part, I will look at the interfaces uh, due to the activation. So I will still, I have modified a little bit the content of my talk, and I will start with it. So it, it is also related to my own uh, research topics, so, and since my advice against that is, I will include it. And it also picks the notation for all of us. So in the first part, I will talk about incompressible fluids. In the second, on compressible fluids. So in incompressible setting, uh, for general description of incompressible fluids, if we are not interested in thermal effects, so this is the description. And there is, uh, so we have the velocity field, which is consisting of three components, is divergence free constraint. P is the normal mean stress, which is due to the fact that the fluid is incompressible, so it is a part of the unknown. And S uh, is the part of the Cauchy stress tensor that can be specified constitutively. And uh, I will be interested in, uh, in uh, problems in uh, isolated domain, so no inflow to outflow, and uh, we have some initial condition prescribed. And uh, one would maybe ask the question, is it possible to extend the various program, existence of the weak solutions for the large data, to bigger class of fluids? And this will be the, so I will answer this positively in the first part, yeah, so, but going that, so, uh, this is the classical energy balance which you obtain if you take a scalar product of this equation with the V. So there is no significant uh, change in the notation. And if you integrate over the omega, so you will obtain, due to this term, some boundary terms, which, which are here. And uh, also from this uh, term you will get this term and from uh, uh, this time you will get change of the total kinetic energy. Since we assume that uh, there is no impermeability through the boundary this time vanishes. But this still can contribute to the equations and uh, uh, if one use the decomposition into the tangent part and normal part and uh, uh, use the orthogonality etc. So one will end up uh, with the relation that this quantity, which I was interested in here, is minus S V dynamic product with N, uh, can be some of uh, reduces to the product of the tangential component of the velocity and uh, the tangential part of the velocity and tangential part of the normal, here should be normal vector, normal traction. So this is what we get. Here is some schematic picture to fix the notation. So this is the normal vector, this is that normal traction. 
and then this is this projection to the tangent plane. And I will use the special symbol little s for negative part of this quantity. So this little s is this vector. So here is the notation somewhere here. The s is okay. And uh, in this uh, product, we can see immediately three interesting cases. So if veto is uh, zero, so we will get uh, no slip, and this part vanishes. If s uh, is zero, so again this term vanishes. But this is so-called slip boundary condition or perfect slip boundary condition. Or, and if these quantities are somehow linearly related, so we will get Navier slip boundary condition. So after doing that, so even if in this general setting, when we did not specify the class of the fluids, so we will get this type of, uh, of energy equality. And in order to close the system, so we need to add a material dependent relation which involves these two quantities. In the Navier-Stokes equation, we just have a linear relation. If we would have that S is equal to zero, so we would get Euler fluid. Uh, if we would assume that all our processes are such that uh, dV is zero, so this is like constraint to the processes, it would mean that we are interested in the rigid body motions. So this would be that dV is zero. So you see that there is somehow physically difference between putting uh, when when this can vanish. And the same we can do here. So so we we can add a material dependent. We need to add a material dependent relation involving SMVT. So it is a, a second part of the missing boundary condition here. So in order to get closed system for this type of equation, we need to add these uh, these relations and these relations basically constitute the behavior of the material in bulk. This is the first equation. And the second one characterizes how it behaves at the, at the boundary. So this is the, uh, so both, both are somehow equally important because changing the boundary condition can have significant impact on the behavior of the fluid. So one cannot say that if one is interested to, so yeah, this is what I would like to emphasize that, uh, that uh, we are more focusing on this, but, uh, but somehow uh, equally important applications are also the conditions on the boundary. And uh, these type of material dependent relations are called constitutive equations. Okay. So, Yusuf, a quick question. So, the, um, the, the little s is tangential to the boundary by, by definition? Yes, yes, it is here. The definition is here. So S is uh, this normal traction, this negative, so negative normal traction projected to the tangent plane. So this is, uh, because this is what remains yeah, there, effectively. Because the normal component is somehow orthogonal to the tangent component of the velocity. And normal component of the velocity is somehow considered to be zero because we do not want to have any inflow or outflow. Thank you. So, so there's no need for the, uh, the dotted or the V tau there, it's just dotted V there. Once more. So you dotted S with the tangential part of the velocity, but you can just dot it with the velocity. Yes, yes, but I wanted to emphasize what is somehow, what is really, of course you can, it is orthogonal to other normal components, but, uh, but uh, uh, here you want to know what, what you have to specify, what really you, you need to relate. Yes, so, so you do not need because, okay. It is of interest that if you look in the, in the literature, which chemists and engineers and food uh, people in food industry, etc., proposed uh, within the scope of incompressible fluid at the level of uh, continuum fluid mechanics. So all the classes, which all the, all the classes of uh, constitutive equation can be included into one of these. I'm currently very much interested in these, but I will totally skip them from this lecture. Yeah, so this is, so let us first talk about this, this class. So you see the Navier-Stokes is linear relation, but in general, this quantity can be related implicitly. And uh, we are asking the question, so for what class of such materials we can develop a reasonable mathematical theory? And also before that, I wanted to, to uh, 
document that this class is uh, somehow very useful. It not only includes the Navier-Stokes equation, but it includes various type of models when the viscosity is depending either on the shear rate or shear stress and the three-dimensional generalization, but also the reciprocal quantity, which is called fluidity, can depend on these uh, quantities. So not only like classical power law model when S is nonlinear function of D are included here, but also so-called stress power law fluid when D is a nonlinear function of S belongs to this class. But more importantly, we can include into the analysis and it also falls to this class other fluid with activation. You know, if you look in the description of Bingham fluid, this is usually done with the dichotomy relation. But uh, it is not needed, and one can really write it nicely as the continuous equation over the, as the curve over the Cartesian product of S and D. And this is exactly this. So if S is below the, the certain threshold, D is zero, and if it is greater, so you calculate and you will get the classical relation for the Bingham fluid, which corresponds to the classical graph I will show them in a minute. But uh, since uh, we started to be interested in this uh, symmetric relation between S and D, the dual model to this is uh, just activated Euler. So basically you have a fluid which behaves like the Euler, but uh, at certain threshold D star it becomes activated and it behaves as the Navier-Stokes fluid. This has, uh, this description, I don't know, this is, this seems not to be addressed in fluid mechanics books, so maybe it is uh, just uh, some useless model, but uh, uh, maybe not. So in particular, since it lies between the classes which are of significant interest in the mathematical community. But more important is that uh, using this uh, description, you can very easily allow that these material coefficients d star, sigma star, nu, and one over nu here, can change with various quantities. Here, there is example when it changes with the, with the temperature, but it can also change with uh, uh, pore pressures and uh, concentration, etc. So, so this is a tool which allows to include this model into the mathematical framework and to work with it uh, in a much more easier way than it is done so far. This is my viewpoint. It has also another advantages. Instead of uh, really describing uh, the models which are included, so I prefer here this uh, table. So here you see this Navier-Stokes fluid in the middle. The Euler fluid is the mod. So basically these are the graphs when on, the, on this axis you have the S and on the x-axis you have D. So this is the SD relations. So this is Euler, this is uh, navier stokes this would correspond, this line would correspond to the, to the rigid bodies. If you stay in this, uh, in this uh, horizontal way, so you go here in this column, in the middle column you have fluids which are without activation, like navier stokes And here you have a, a model that after activation behaves like navier stokes so behaves like Navier-Stokes after activation, so, so this is this Bingham. If it is in this dual way, so this is this Euler Navier-Stokes model. And of course the fluid may after activation behave in different way, not only linearly, it can be nonlinear, like here, it can even exhibit such phenomena like limiting shear rate that are also of interest and vice versa. So I hope that you get certain impression uh, about these models. So I will talk about the analysis, and the analysis uh, includes uh, basically this, uh, this, this uh, limiting shear stress and limiting shear rate requires some extra effort. But, uh, but uh, I will be able to provide the results which concern these uh, three rows. Yeah, so, 
The same can be done for the boundary condition. Here I was not so much interested in drawing the picture for nonlinear responses after activation, but it can be done. It's not a problem. It is simply boundary condition. To treat this type of boundary condition is easier than to treat the, the, this uh, constraint equation before. So here you see no slip as uh, this uh, limiting case. So it is again like constraint. So this is this basically it's like uh, can be understood as the constraint to the admissible processes. While this is really the constraint equation. So this is like requirement that all processes are such that uh, that uh, all flows are such that they adhere at the boundary. This is the slip condition. And this is the Navier slope slip, and you can also have stick slip and slip Navier slip. So this is stick slip is to me very interesting condition because it behaves like no slip and absent certain activation it starts to slip following uh, for example the Navier slip uh, relation. And this is this uh, dual relation. So so it is perfectly slipping up to a certain threshold and after that friction somehow starts to play more significant role. These pictures I want to document that uh, that it is really interface problem yeah? because here the fluid in this dark behaves like rigid body, so it's uh, like uh, solid materials and you and this uh, light blue and colorblind so maybe it's a different color. So it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's fluid. Yes. So so you see that uh, it, it really captures the interface uh, interface uh, behavior. Uh, between two materials. Uh, so now I can set up the problem in the following way. <coughs> so these are the added constitutive equation. In some of the, of course, we we will be interested in those those uh, responses that. Uh, I, that can be described by a maximal monotone graph, yes? But important is that it uh, allows, that it only requires monotonicity. Due to the monicity, monotonicity, you can include this activation criteria. So that you can have this flatten and, uh, and uh, regions. So it, uh, the same at the boundary. So these are the data. <coughs> and uh, that's basically a long list, which I do not want to document, but uh, Somehow, uh, while all this was basically going from from focus on one one or two models that go beyond the Navier Stokes, and basically it was the Paolo model, and uh, the interest was uh, basically to make the theory robust in dependence of this Paolo index to include uh, the largest range. So. In this uh, in this article, we a little bit uh, changed the focus, and we were interested in what is the largest class of fluids which can be described uh, uh, by this. And uh, I would also maybe emphasize this paper because it is focused on the analysis of the of the model. When you use this activation criteria, but this activation parameter are changing with the temperature. Here it is changing with the with the pore pressure, and uh, this polar activated fluids, which I was mentioned, are specifically analyzed in in this uh, in this article. So the classification which I presented together with uh, with current state of the mathematical analysis for for this three-dimensional flows of this activated Euler is included uh, in this paper. Anna Batileo and Tomas Rosa in the audience. Okay. So this was the first part. So I wanted to give you the message that, uh, that uh, activation can be used to capture basically the to, to go from one regime to another regime and basically to that, uh, that, uh, that place where it changes, it uh, can describe the interfaces. And so, so this, uh, and uh, another message was that, uh, that uh, you can basically do the same 
what Larry did for the Navier Stokes equation, also for the class of fluids uh, when this part of Cauchy's stress tensor and D are related uh, via the maximum monotone graph. Basically, that's it. Yeah, so, so you need some corresponding <coughs> conditions, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, it's uh, very general. Okay. Then I want to, in the last part, I want to go to the top left fluids and to talk about the, this is compressible fluid, and talk about the development of the boundary condition. So I said this is a very important topic from various reasons. But before that, I, I wanted to make it, uh, present a thermodynamical approach which we are using and which according to me is uh, simple and uh, it is motivated uh, also from my perspective by or it is always we try to do it in the way that uh, it has certain also connections to PD analysis or consequences to the PD analysis and uh, and so, so it is not just uh, done by physics itself, but it is also thinking about uh, what PD analysts can do with it. It is maybe nonsense, as I said, but it's okay. So, of course, you have various approaches to thermodynamics. And uh, I think the thermodynamics is a very important tool. And one should uh, try to get uh, as much as possible from this. And I think uh, much more is hidden there than we still cannot discover. There are different approaches which are motivated by classical mechanics. So I will not use the Hamiltonian approach, but I will start with the balance equations. So like Newtonian approach. So balance equations place uh, in our description, key role, basically not key role, but this is the starting setup. And uh, then in this balance equation, you have plenty of quantities which uh, you have to relate to other quantities in order to get a closed system of equation. And constitutive theory is the approach how to, how to get this closed relation. And uh, this is again not novel, but, uh, but I think it's nice to to understand that you can get all this constitutive equation or the structure just from the knowledge of constitutive equation for two scalar quantities. One of them is uh, entropy or thermodynamical potential. Here, these are Helmholtz free energy, internal energy, Gibbs potential, and enthalpy. So, this basically asks or requires from the person that uh, who is interested in describing the materials to know how the material stores the energy. And another thing which is important is to know how the material produces the entropy, how to dissipate the energy. So this is the second, and this is again information about the scale. <coughs> Rate of entropy production is scalar quantity. So if you know these two scalars, so constitutive theory, which I will present, gives you the all other consideration. I will focus on this quarterback fluid, but it can be applied to mixtures, and, uh, and again, it's the same. Just from the knowledge of two quantities, you will get uh, the rest. So here it's uh, a description of that strain graph. So you have the balance equation. I would maybe make a line here. So this is balance of mass, balance of linear momentum, balance of angular momentum, and balance of energy in certain form. So you can understand it as the system of uh, five equations for these five unknowns. But in this equation, you have uh, tensorial quantity, vectorial quantities. You have also the formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. So it is good to, to express it in this way. Yeah, so the second law of thermodynamics is done in classical mechanics. In continuum mechanics, it is uh, supposed that uh, somehow locally the fluid is equilibrium and, and somehow this quantity is non-negative. 
and you can define it. So you can say, okay, but this is the rate of entropy production. So let us have this identity and add this uh, information that this uh, zeta is non negative as uh, the constant. So this is the formulation of the second law, that's law of thermodynamics and so on. So use of our question. So Coleman and Noel, they introduced this methodology, but not with a specified entropy production, just with an inequality, just simply a statement that for all processes, entropy must increase. And the second law must be valid. So can you specify the entropy production? How much more information does that give you relative to the Coleman and Noel process? It's a. Uh, it's maybe good for the after the talk. Okay. Maybe to the coffee. I don't know if the audience will be interested because it's really this is long development in the field. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes, Coleman. Maybe I will make two comments. So in Coleman uh, approach, I think that uh, they really uh, were interested or insist somehow or they very limited in some sense mm -hmm. uh, to the situation when the entropy flux is uh, always the energy flux divided by temperature. But I did not say still what is the temperature here, yes. So another thing is that uh, they use it in the way which I, which was successful in certain simple cases, in quotation marks simple. But when you go to more complex materials, you see that it uh, goes to the quite uh, machinery, which you, you cannot. Uh, and they use it basically to get restriction on the on the on the on the material coefficients. So they did not, I think, use it uh, uh, to get constant equation. But for example, Groot and Mazur, the Groot and Mazur use it to, to get. So so this approach is very similar to plenty of approaches, yeah, which I have in literature. So, so again, I would include that as here you've got an additional constitutive law, which is an entropy production law. And that gives you more information. Yeah, yeah I, I said that, that I would separate it. And the reason why I would separate it is uh, that, uh, that this is somehow, you should use it, but you can essentially decide what kind of form of energy balance is uh, important for you. Or it is not important, but, uh, but it is, uh, you can manage it, basically mathematically handle it. So for example, this is frequently used by engineers. But if you do analysis for incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, it is much more convenient to work with the, with the balance of energy in the original form, and this is the form for the total energy. So when, when you have uh, that uh, change of the <coughs> internal energy plus kinetic energy, give you a divergence of the same. You should write it maybe. This divergence of the Cauchy stress tensor times V minus this uh, energy flux shape. But can you somebody force it through the V? So this uh, in incompressible fluids for some some models, this quantity is somehow better than L1. So it is and it is in divergence form. So it is much easier to, to deal with this equation instead of, uh, of this equation, where basically due to that for due to this TV in three dimension, you only, only have L1 information. So this is why usually people can only manage it with the inequality here. I, I do not know, yes, except, or, or you have to have some regularity or whatever. So, so, so it is much more convenient to work with this equation, but for compressible fluids, uh, Edward Feyerizer is basically working with this type of identity, or, or in fact inequality, not considered as equality, but inequality, but at the requirement that he's, since he's interested in an isolated system, the total energy of the system is conserved. And again, this is somehow equivalent on the level of classical solutions, but uh, regarding the Context of PD analysis in the context of weak solution, this is different. So, this is my comment. Here. So, 
So now I said that uh, okay that uh, the first information which you should know is uh, uh, the constant equation for for example for entropy and this is motivated again classical mechanics this is for example in the book of Kalan this is like this so so you you can assume that entropy is some function of the internal energy and some other state variable and it is such function that uh, that uh, it is increasing and the temperature is defined in this way but uh, this is experiments very very difficult to get so it is much more convenient that to work with other thermodynamical potential from the point of view of application so for example Helmholtz free energy is uh, uh, used if uh, you know information about how your material coefficient depends on the temperature so on so if you use this this and uh, the previous relation you can end up with something which uh, which one can view as the analog of the clausius dehem inequality. Yeah, with those. But, uh, but now I am not restricted to isothermal processes. This is a uh, really uh, general form where it uh, always, I do not require that uh, this, this bracket is C0. So, and what you could also notice that here I am only taking, uh, yeah, which I should maybe emphasize that. So I have this eta. This is missing one information. That if I start with eta being function of e and y1 of 2yn, so then, then I will get that c is the function of the temperature and y1 of 2yn. Okay. And uh, in this uh, identity, I only have the derivative. Of course, I've already eliminated this uh, relation with respect to the temperature. So I have only the, the relation which includes the derivative of psi tilde with respect to these quantities. And this can be of different type, yeah? Scalar vectors and those. These are symbolic. Okay. And here is the comment that if it is, so it uh, shrinks to this form. So, uh, yes, so, and the idea is that uh, now if you know precisely or if you know on which and how this psi depends on this y1 and yn, so you have to select them, you have to say what are these quantity of your interest and how they depend, how this helps the energy. So you can insert it here and you can calculate the psi, the form of the psi. And, uh, uh, what you will get, what, what is your aim, not that what you will get. The aim is to get it as the sum of the products when each product would represent different physical mechanisms. It is not uh, always possible, but uh, if you are lucky, so yeah. And then if it is happen, so then either you require that uh, this J alpha is uh, related to A alpha linearly with positive coefficients, it can be also vice versa, like A alpha is uh, uh, proportional to J alpha, which seems to be trivial, but of course you have to always require that coefficient is positive. So you will get this quadratic dissipation, but you can have also more complicated dissipation. It depends on, and you can also see the connection with this implicit relation that uh, in principle, if this re really are different physical mechanisms, so you can go beyond these linear relations and consider uh, just uh, general implicit relation among them. Here is the example, just to be a little bit specific. So if psi is the function of temperature and rho, so in this, in this moment, the y, I have only m equal to 1, and this y1 is the density. And I insert it there, so I will get the following, uh, following relation. And uh, now I see that uh, psi would be zero if uh, TV is zero, J eta is zero, and M is equal minus uh, this thermodynamical pressure, so which corresponds as compressible Euler. If I require that, I will have this linear relation, and I will get the quadratic terms, so I will get the, the compressible Navier-Stokes equation. 
Okay, and with this relations, I will get compressible now. We have stored full work equation. Okay, so this is this was just example. One can do it also in compressible setting, of course. And uh, what I like here that if this is my clear understanding why why the pressure is unspecified for incompressible fluid because uh, it cannot be specified because you basically if the fluid is incompressible, this part of dissipative. I did not emphasize, but this part of dissipative mechanism uh, basically vanishes, and you do, you cannot say what is one set of trace of T. Yeah, so it has to be unknown, basically, because you are, you, you are not uh, capable of specifying experimentally if the fluid is incompressible. I will try to be quick. But, uh, still, you know, it, it was this product T and D. And uh, I was saying that it is always nice to, to have it uh, so that it represents different physical mechanism. And uh, here it can be done in the way that uh, you basically split it into the deviatory part and uh, the trace part. And this trace part will give you this one set of trace T times divergence. So this is in fact this contribution here. Okay, the divergence times m when m is one set of it. So why I do this splitting? Because this this product is uh, responsible for physics uh, <coughs> at uh, physical processes that are volume conserving. There is no change in the volume. Why this uh, this uh, contributes to the to the volume changing processes? So. Uh, when I talk about the different physics, so this is the, what I meant. He tried to write this, uh, my younger colleague with Prusha, some quite long handbook article about uh, how simple the thermodynamics can be. I would also like to say that, uh, that Schrodinger, I think, <coughs> made the comment that uh, in understanding of thermodynamics there are three stages. First stage, you do not understand anything. <laughs> Second stage, you think that you are master. And third stage, that you do not understand anything again. <laughs> so, so I am basically prepared that, uh, that uh, this third stage will come soon. Yes, we, no, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have feeling that, uh, that you can do something with it. But, uh, but uh, yeah. So let me talk about the the quarteric fluid. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, related to the talk of uh, Helmut Abels, in the sense that uh, uh, we have uh, this quarteric stress for high order, high order term, but uh, the model is somewhat simple because the order parameter is uh, just uh, the same, so there is no extra extra equations uh, in that direction. This uh, quarteric model belongs to the class of diffuse interface model. It is also nice that uh, it allows for topological changes. Uh, and uh, the uh, some of the main application is uh, liquid. Uh, understand basically the the processes uh, phase changes, phase transformation. So we have one material, and uh, it uh, goes from uh, liquid to vapor, or from, from vapor to liquid. This is uh, to think drop, drop, drop of water in the air. Yeah, so drops of water. This is you can think about. And uh, these two guys were really contributing significantly to the development, basically this uh, diffuse interface model because they were basically suggesting that this, uh, this uh, interface between these two materials, between this liquid phase and vapor phase, is not sharp and in fact uh, can have certain thickness. And there are currently experimental data which shows that it is the case, but uh, this uh, thickness is somehow irrelevant to the, to the what we are using in numerics, etc. Yeah? Because this is much, much. So we use it as the as the possible way how to describe the material. Okay. 
this is the this is the Navier Stokes quarterback system. So it looks balance of mass, balance of linear momentum of the same. This is, looks like Navier Stokes. Fine. But now boom. Yes, so you have this uh, this term and also you have another contributions to the to the so since it is divergent, so so it is like said, derivative of density appears in the equations, and you have uh, the addition and nonlinearity. So, question which you can ask: uh, Is this model somehow consistent with the continuum thermodynamics? You know how to select the boundary conditions for this? Mm -hmm. Typically, people take that zero, the n is zero, but uh, it is restrictive because uh, it uh, leads only to the static contact angle p half. So. You know, you, you have uh, basically this uh, interface. Here is your here is your domain. Here is some of the interface, maybe between the. Uh, so this is the liquid. And so you are interested in in uh, in this uh, evolution of these contact lines or contact interfaces, because now now they are not sharp, so they are they are like uh, like this, but. Uh, this zero d n has the disadvantage that it gives uh, just uh, 90 degrees, and you would like to, you know, in experiments it does not, uh, you know, you have various type of uh, behavior. That not, it's not true. So the questions are here: Is it thermodynamically consistent? Can we develop uh, uh, the whole? How? What is the most general class of boundary condition? Which can, we can associate to that model in such a way that uh, the whole system will be thermodynamically, also the boundary condition will form the system which is thermodynamically consistent. And this is the example, to me, quite simple, simplest example, where it is difficult to specify in an ad hoc manner. To basically guess what are the boundary conditions is uneasy. And more important, uh, for various applications, you would like to include thermal effects. And now this is the big issue, how to do it. You know, again, you, know, it's, uh, you should just add the heat equation and uh, modify the coefficients, put the coefficients dependent on the temperature. Is it all? Or should I include more? So this is uh, really not easy. Maybe literature. Skip, but uh, some of the, the what I am presenting, I want it that it is available on archive today, but it is not. But still, I'm here in this trimester, so for another week. So I think that in March it will be there. Yeah. So I think that uh, you know this. Uh, I think I have it from Kara Jakupal for the first time, but or I read it from one of his article. I don't know. But there is statement that boundary conditions are constant equation. And this really, I tried to already motivate it before, but this, this is the, the key standpoint. Yeah? So that, uh, that you start to think about boundary condition again as the constant equation, but on the surfaces. And uh, now you would like basically to do the same things as before, but uh, you would like to include the boundary. And uh, I will not go through the detail, but the idea is that uh, oh, we, the history is such that with Martin Heide we had certain approach. We knew that it is not the best one. I had objections to that, but then we met Andrei Sovchik, and so he told us that we are not doing properly. So it took us maybe six years to do it properly, but uh, the idea is that first you need balance equation again. And what you do, you there is a approach that if you have continuum and if you have some surface which is not moving with the with the flow, such surface is called singular surface. So you can basically also write the balance equation including this uh, singular surface. This is for example done in the book by Ingo Miller, but and I think maybe Ingo Miller was the first one who really did it. Yes, so in the 67, but uh, in his book 85. Okay, so this is first idea. And then the idea is that you look at the boundary as the singular surface. Yes, so what I draw here, so now 
if I again consider my another domain, so now I will look at the boundary as this singular surface. So now my continuum is the uh, inner part, outer part. And this is, uh, so of course I usually do not know anything about the outer part. So I will then reduce the balance equation, but uh, still I will keep what is happening here and what is happening, uh, what is happening uh, inside. So here is the description. I will not, I will be very really brief. So here is the description of that uh, continuum with this uh, single surface, and that you can build basically the balance equations. And these balance equations in, a, in this plus minus sign, so here it is like plus minus sign, has this standard structure. So there is some change of the quantity, which is equal to diffusion of that quantity through the boundary. So this is this is this part, but then can be some other diffusive processes like heat flux or, or stress power. There can be some production terms. And now I forgot what is the last one, but it doesn't matter. So, <coughs> this is like sources, and so, and this is maybe like inner production. Uh, so, so you have certain product production terms, you have certain fluxes. So this is the general structure of balance equation. You can put all the balance equation which I listed into this form. But uh, you can also get, if you now basically think, and how you get it in the here and here. You basically take any subset and you formulate uh, for the for the for this uh, volume element, balance of mass, balance of linear momentum, balance of energy, and then since it is true for arbitrary subset, measurable subset, you will get this local identity. If you have, if you, if uh, your set includes this uh, singular state theory, so so there is more complicated structure, but again, the form is uh, very similar. Yeah, so. This is uh, this basically is replacing uh, these two guys. This and this goes to this. Then you have divergence of some some fluxes. Of course, now this divergence is uh, surface divergence. There is some effect uh, due to the curvature of the singular surface. Then uh, you have uh, again the production terms, and then there is uh, somehow the contribution from these bulk quantities, from plus sign and from like minus sign. So you have again the general structure of the balance equation. And uh, <coughs> you can proceed with the same methodology. And we did it uh, in the way that we assume that on the surface, so in the bulk, we basically consider, so here now we reduce it to this situation, we forget about plus, and in the, in the, in the, but we consider that quarter fluid. But on the boundary, we can have uh, boundary can be such that there are no storing that, that it does not store any energy, or it can store energy in such a way that it depends on temperature associated with the with the with the with the surface, or it can depend also on the density. So you can basically proceed and uh, and uh, you can. I will skip it, yeah, so it's not a, it's, it's long computation and a, a lot of notation connected with the fact that now you are working on the surfaces. But otherwise, uh, philosophically, it is uh, very similar. And if you, yes, if you do it, so you will, you will get for these uh, three types of models, boundary conditions, so this is for the most general model. But uh, I will again skip it. And uh, uh, it includes various type of phenomena, but I will now go to the situation when, when here we are more explicit and we consider this uh, classical van der Waals uh, model, so which is described by this uh, constant equation. So now this psi is the uh, in bulk. Yeah? So this is what I was talking uh, talking before. Is linked to what uh, closely linked to what Helmut Albers was talking about, so I will skip it in the description. But uh, then 
you see this is uh, this is that little s which I have and this is that uh, relations to V dot here is this negative sign so this is the uh, Navier-Slip boundary condition but there is additional contribution so what we obtain is uh, some type of condition which generalizes Navier-Slip condition but we also did not get that 0 n is just 0 but it can be related to to either divergence of the boundary or the normal component of the of the derivative of the of the vn with respect to to normal vector associated to the boundary through the another quantities what is nice or not nice but uh, maybe it is on the next slide if uh, one even specify it more so you see that in the generalized slip condition there is parameter beta but this beta also appear here and uh, now as I said if zero, zero with respect to n gamma would be zero it would correspond to the to that uh, static angle with p half but now you have uh, flexibility and uh, and you can yeah this is like type of dynamic contact because this uh, this uh, beta is changing this v so you can uh, uh, well, there is some back in progress this is, this, is, this is basically how we work in Prague, yeah? so this is, uh, we are very slow, you see, so, that was, uh, so based on the last decade experience, which was seven years, so we estimated this, uh, so, so one can go through the experiments, I don't know if it will be possible to have it, yeah, so, you see, one can basically get the flow, so the starting situation is like this. So you have uh, one phase, another phase, and you prescribe what you would like to have. Uh, you understand relations to the angle. This is that magic formula above, and uh, uh, you can now prescribe. You would like to have line interface. So you prescribe angle with which it should be at the top and with which it should be above, and uh, and uh, you see that. Uh, it basically will go, this dynamic condition will go to that static angle condition which you prescribe there. You can manage it. I don't know if uh, the video sounds like this. So another experiment which, uh, which is available is the spreading of the, of the drop in the air and again uh, what I wanted to show you the, the, the evolution of that angle. So basically, this is this is that drop, and this is uh, the end of that drop. But uh, I don't know if it's not that Maybe I forgot something. So what we see is the effect of this dynamic boundary condition there. But the last thing, uh, using uh, this type of boundary condition we could uh, explain what is sometimes called uh, contact angle hysteresis or, or not explain but we can give possible explanation yes to this phenomena that this type of boundary condition can easily manage it and the the, the effect is such that uh, you basically li this liquid drop is going in this direction along that inclined plane so that the in front angle is different than the then the angle and uh, you can go back and uh, yes, that's it. So there are conclusion, but I think I would be happy to 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 answer any question and this is uh, uh, if I can. Right. Okay, thank you. So since ninety one we organize some school focus on mathematical aspect of uh, of fluid flows. Recently it is combined with another school, so we organize it every year. It is in quite nice place. These are the speakers for this uh, this uh, year. Here are the some of the titles, but I will return it back. What I want to say is that uh, you know when we started in ninety one we had the majority of Czech participants and three, four if I remember well, point participants. Uh, 
Now we have 50 participants, and I think six of them are Czech. Yeah, so, so I'm not. Uh, so what I want to say is that if you would be interested, so please register and do it quickly because the registration may be poor, but it's an interesting place for young people to meet. Laszlo was there, Jan Brinje was there, and many others. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, so in fact, uh, for Navier Stokes equation, uh, you are not, uh, you basically, if you, yeah, what is the reason? So, if, it's like, okay, let's, let's do this. Thank you for your question. And uh, let me go back just because it will be easy to explain on this uh, on this identity which I had here. You see, if uh, if we consider that just the psi tilde depends on the density, so then we need equation for d or dt. But this is just uh, just uh, rho minus rho divergence v. So we will, in that case, for Navier Stokes, so we really get, uh, so we will get this, these terms, yes, T B minus J eta gradient of eta, and from this, what remains is just this thermodynamic pressure, which is this rho square times the deep side with respect to D rho, times divergence. And then we have minus divergence of this. And this is equal to, to that. And uh, if we split this into the deviatoric part and this traceless, so we add this uh, traceless, trace part, not traceless, trace part we will add here. Yes. So, so we basically got this uh, product. Let us think that we got this product of different physical mechanism. And the uh, divergence, what is under the divergence is in this form. So there is no other contribution, yes? So, so this is why here for the Navier Stokes, we just, uh, in order to eliminate this, so we just say that Je is related to theta J eta. But if you make just a little change, and you would consider that this psi tilde of psi is the function of the theta, rho, and gradient of rho. And you, so you, you need to know what is d rho dt, d, this for that. But this you calculate from the balance of mass, so you will get the equation for that. And uh, then, if you want to write it in the terms of the product, so you will get extra, extra terms under the divergence. So, and people were stuck what to do with this term, yes, historically. But uh, it is easy to include it here. If you require that this related, that this relation holds, then you are in trouble. But if you just allow to be included into the divergence, you so this is the immediately this is the example when when it is important not to require that, that because somehow from from that from that derivative you will get some other terms which you try to manage. I can show you this is on the page which I already prepared for the lecture, but I do not want to show, do calculation now, here. Okay. Any other urgent questions? Otherwise, I suggest you go for the coffee break. Okay.